Good morning, students. So what I have decided to do since we will not be having lecture, um, live lecture on Monday is to go ahead and record the lecture for you guys so we don't get behind, okay? So um, I'm going to spend uh, 45 minutes here. Um, again, this is something that I would like for you guys to review on Monday. And um, after this lecture has been completed, I have a couple of questions to, um, that I'll have you guys answer. And again, this is going to allow me to keep roll for the day and um, just also to make sure that you guys uh, did watch the lecture. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I believe we left off on this slide. Uh, speaking, I'm talking about um, enteritis. So remember that um, enteritis, this is the second most common health problem that we see in our rabbits, um, second to pastoralosis, right? So um, many of the, these, these diseases um, that include enteritis are not very well understood. But um, again, it's something that is, um, that can affect our rabbits um, pretty pretty quickly, all right? So um, basically, because we don't know exactly, um, always know what causes it, the best thing that we can do is just treat the symptoms, right? And so that's gonna be our first initial step here. Um, the very first thing we need to do is, again, keeping making sure that the animals um, maintain hydration and body temperature uh, again if the animal has diarrhea they will be losing a lot of warmth through that so um, it's important to keep them warm and also to keep them hydrated and lastly um, we know that diet change could help here. Um, so with our rabbits, we like to feed them a higher fiber diet um, and a lower protein diet. Um, a lot of times this can help um, uh, cure or at least help maintain or not um, prolong any type of enteritis that they may have. Okay. So the first enteritis that we're going to talk about is colibac bacillosis, okay? This is caused by E. coli or Escherichia coli. Now, E. coli is a normal gut flora in pretty much everything. But the one that we have concern about here is one known as enteropathogenic E. coli or EPIC, okay? All right, so EPIC. So um, I need you guys to really pay close attention. I'm going to talk slow, more slowly um, because I can't type in my annotations um, do, um, doing the PowerPoint this way. But make note that EPIC or enteropathogenic E. coli, it does not produce enterotoxins, okay? So this is not like our um, like our C. diff, right? It does not produce enterotoxins and it does not invade the intestinal mucosa. So what happens is, is when we're, <clears throat> when this organism is um, involved with our younger animals, so our one to two week old animals are our, wing, our wingling animals between four to six weeks old, it actually interferes with the with the cell function. So the cell functions of the gut of the GI tract, these bacteria will adhere to the receptors on the enterocytes and it interferes with the with how the cell actually functions. So that can change things, right? Um, the, um, um, we know that when things bind to cells that it changes it some there's a change that's going to happen so what changes are those that occur i'm not a hundred percent sure but it's going to cause issues with that animal and we'll talk about those issues on the next slide all right so continuing on the clinical signs here are non-specific Okay, so again, that the clinical sign that the animal may exhibit can look like a multitude of things, right? So, but grossly um, on an animal who we are necropsying, what we can find is edematous and hemorrhagic cecum, right? So um, basically the cecum has edema, all right? And it could be hemorrhagic, excuse, excuse me. So how do we diagnose that? Well, we can do that through mi microscopy, 
uh, serotyping and biotyping. So biotyping is basically just a way to differentiate bacteria through a biochemical test. Again, biotyping is a way to differentiate bacteria through a biochemical test. So again, treatment is going to be largely supportive. This is with all the um, enteritis that we're gonna speak of. We can give systemic antibiotics, okay? We can give intestinal protectant, so a GI protectant, um, something that's going to coat the, the GI tract. Um, obviously, fluids and electrolytes are going to be helpful here. And we can also reduce the amount of feed that we're giving the rabbit, the rabbits, but increase roughage. So roughage would be things like hay, um, thing, um, things like hay, or even um, sometimes you know apples or fruits, things of that nature, um, just to again um, try to settle that stomach as best as we can. Okay, but now it's important to know that when we're giving antibiotics systemically. So we're giving systemic antibiotics. Again, they can also kill normal gut flora as well. So it's important that we monitor the length of time that we're giving these antibiotics, okay? There are antibiotics that we do not want to use with rabbits because it can cause, it can cause a, um, 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 it could cause their normal gut flora again to to, to die off based on the antibiotics, right? So we don't want to use amoxicillin, ampicillin, or clindamycin. Clindamycin is spelled C-L-I-C-L-I-N-D-A-M-Y-C-I-N. Again, clindamycin, C-L-I-N-D-A-M-Y-C-I-N. Okay, so enterotoxemia. We talked about this with our guinea pigs. We know that enterotoxemia is something that is normally going to be caused by the use of antibiotics, right? So with our rabbits, the most common bacteria that causes this is Clostridium spiriformi. okay? This is the most common pathogen that is associated with enteritis in recently weaned rabbits. However, we can also see this in adult rabbits, okay? So our clostridial species, they're um, um, are absent or found in low numbers in rabbits' large intestines. So with our animals that are weaned, that are between four to eight weeks of age, um, they are experiencing lots of changes in their gut flora. Okay, and so this is likely when the pathogen is going to proliferate, all right? So again, we're going from a rabbit who has been nursing, right, who has been um, suckling on mom, and then they end up, again, eating normal feed, right? So um, this, is, this could cause a problem. This is going to be when that pathogen, um, the Clostridium uh, spiriformi, is going to be most likely to invade and to um, proliferate. Um, sporadic infections are going to be the most common. So again, we, we will see this kind of, we could see this in waves, um, you know, depending on how the animals are being bred and, you know, the weaning and all that stuff. So, um, um, and then also we talked about a C. diff. Um, and see uh, per, uh, perfringens, perfringens, excuse me, these are going to be um, lesser common pathogens that we see. Okay, so like I just mentioned, um, the reason why we see this more in our weanling animals is because there's a change, right? There's a change in feed. Um, they've gone from suckling um, and nursing on milk to now actually eating a diet. So again, we see this more here because the gut flora of the young animal has changed. They're not drinking milk anymore. And again, this is likely when the Clostridium uh, spiriformi will proliferate or colonize, okay? Um, so um, antibiotic therapy, again, can also cause an enterotoxemia.
Again, what we see is hemorrhagic and edematous cecum. And this is diagnosed through several different uh, manners. We can diagnose it by a gram stain of the cecal content. We can take an anaerobic culture. So anaerobic cultures means that these bacteria actually don't need oxygen. So this is why it's an anaerobic bacteria. We need to take an anaerobic culture so we can um, identify the different bacteria here, okay? And depending on the type of clostridial species that is involved, it will produce a specific toxin. And so in this example, the clostridial spiroformy produces the enterotoxin called iodotoxin. So this is the toxin that's involved. This is the toxin that, you know, can, can eventually um, cause death in, our, in the patient, okay? We can also do uh, cytotoxicity assays. We can do ELISA and PCR tests as well. So some supportive uh, treatment that we can do for an animal who is experiencing, uh, for a rabbit who is experiencing um, some sort of enterotoxemia is obviously going to be supportive therapy, okay? So we can add copper sulfate to their diet. This may, um, this may reduce the amount of toxin that's produced. So copper is interesting here in that it can kill bacteria and it could kill fungus. So this is something that um, can be added to the animal's diet um, to try to just suppress that toxin buildup and to you know, kill off some of the bacteria, okay? And oral probiotics are also beneficial. Um, so just like we eat yogurt, right? We know that um, yogurt has lots of probiotics in it, um, such as lactobacillus, L-A-C-T-O-B-A-C-I-L-L-U-S. We know that that's something that actually helps normal gut flora. And so by giving this, this could be something that could be beneficial. We know that the normal gut flora is very important here, okay? We know that antibiotics um, are typically going to be what is associated with these outbreaks of enterotoxemia. Again, killing off the normal, the normal gut flora is going to allow the gut flora that is not as prominent to proliferate. Okay, so the types of antibiotics that can be used, or sorry, that cannot be used are um, erythromycin, clindamycin, lincomycin, and streptomycin. Okay, so the antibiotics that are considered safe to give our rabbits who are, who are experiencing um, enterotoxemia are going to be enrofloxin, which is Batril, trimethoprim sulfa, and metronidazole. So metronidazole is a antibiotic that is used to treat anaerobic bacteria. We would prefer to give these um, parenterally instead of oral. Now, obviously, if, you know, you don't have a choice, you know, it can be either or, but parenteral is going to be the, um, the preferable route here, okay? And then when we are giving these animals antibiotics, again, we have to understand that this could also cause a, a problem. So we can also just take some preventative measurements here and also give oral lactobacillus. And that could be yogurt. That could be, um, it could come in a powdered form where we could sprinkle, you know, in something that they like, like, you know, applesauce I talked about, sprinkling, sprinkling it on their food um, and things like that. And um, hopefully that will help inhibit the toxins. So the next enteritis that we're going to talk about is known as proliferative enteropathy. This is caused by the bacteria Lysonia intracellularis. Now, basically, proliferative enteropathy just means a disease of the intestines. And this, this bacteria can uh, or affects a wide variety of species. We can see this in hamsters, ferrets, and pigs, along with rabbits. All right. And when this has been isolated from different species, from when the Lysonia intracellularis has been isolated from different species, there is very little genetic variation. 
All right. So that means that intraspecies or interspecies transmission is likely. So they could be transmitting it again within their species or between species. All right. And it's going to commonly affect our younger animals. So remember, as our animals um, begin to become older, um, the passive maternal immunity declines, right? And so at this point, again, this is where we can see um, a lot of opportunistic bacteria, you know, come in and, and, and take over. So again, when we see the term epizootic, that means that we are talking about a disease that is temporarily prevalent in a widespread um, of animals um, within that population, okay? So again, and this is a disease that is temporarily prevalent within that population of animals, and the specific population we're talking about here is our younger animals, okay? It can be transmitted through the fecal oral route, and the intestines is the only thing that appears to be um, infected. So here's a picture of a rabbit that has proliferative um, entero, um, enteropathy, all right? And um, ill, looks pretty gross, doesn't it? So um, originally the um, animals are going to have a subclinical infection. So that means that they have, they are not um, um, exhibiting any clinical signs yet of having the organism or having the disease, all right? Um, but during that time, they are still shedding the bacteria in their feces, all right? So again, this is, um, they are um, um, asymptomatic at this point, but they are still shedding the bacteria in their feces, which means that it could be transmitted to other animals, okay? Um, stressors um, may actually predis um, predispose the animal to clinical infection. And so some of those stressors can be things like overcrowding, um, when an animal is being transported, um, a change in diet, and even experimental um, manipulation. All of those things cause stress, right? Um, even a change in diet can be something that's stressful to the animal because it's something that's new. Um, obviously, experimental manipulations, you're actually having to handle the animal, you're doing certain things with the animal that could cause stress. Obviously, overcrowding can be stressful when the animal doesn't have enough room to, you know, get away or, you know, do do what it, what it would normally do in the wild. And then transportation, that's a stressful event in itself. Okay, so clinical signs. Um, clinical signs, what we will see is a very distended abdomen, and you would actually hear a sloshing sound within the intestine. So it um, it's actually sounds like there's water in the intestines, and you don't hear the normal gurgling, bubbly sounds that you would on a rabbit, but instead you would hear almost like a water sound in the intestines, okay? Um, of course, hunch posture, depression, those are kind of nonspecific clinical signs. Uh, polydipsia, they will begin to drink more, more water. They can become anorexic, and of course, because they're losing so much um, fluid, uh, they can become hypothermic. Um, and typically, these animals are going to be constipated, and then that will be followed by a profuse mucoid diarrhea. And that's what we're seeing here in this picture. Shame on this person for not having on gloves. Ill. Okay, so grossly um, at necropsy, what we see with these animals is a proliferative, uh, is proliferative uh, jejunitis or um, ileitis. So again, that's inflammation of the small intestines. That intestines can also be thickened, okay? And then we are also going to have some sort of uh, mucus fluid within the small intestine. So that's what's making that, that nasty sloshy sound, okay? It could be diagnosed through a combination of things um, at necropsy. Uh, we can do um, histopath on the tissue. We can do uh, take back um, samples and do and run cultures, so bacteriology. Uh, we can even run ELISA and PCR tests as well. All right, so how do we treat this? Um, well, usually any treatment that we do is going to be ineffective. Uh, we can, though, however, again give the animal intense fluid therapy. That's the best thing that we can do, right? We wanna keep them hydrated. Um, we can give um, broad spectrum antibiotics. 
um, to help with the early stages of the disease. But again, we have to be careful because we don't want to, again, um, have an effect on the animal's normal gut flora. Excuse me. It is very important, however, that we do provide them with some type of heat source because they will become hypothermic. Now, some preventative measures that we can take is we can actually decrease the animal's food take about 48 hours uh, before shipment in hopes to uh, in hopes that they won't, you know, just have a whole lot of uh, food in their in their guts um, to where they're not you know, releasing all of this um, at once. Um, hopefully that can, you know, that could play a role in preventing the proliferative um, enteropathy. So the next disease that we're going to talk about is tizers. We've um, talked about this in every species that we've talked about thus far, except zebrafish, of course. Um, so tizers, again, is going to be caused by Clostridium piliformi. Again, this is a spore form bacteria, right? So that means that it can be in the environment for some time, right? Okay. Um, and what we see here is um, infections that cause acute hemorrhagic typhlocolitis. Typhlocolitis is the inflammation of the cecum and the colon. All right. And then there's that word epizootic again. So this is going to be concentrated to a certain population of our animals. And again, the population is going to be our wingling rabbits between the ages of six to 12 weeks of age. Morbidity and mortality can be very high here. All right, so um, it is uncommon for an animal um, to have Tizer's disease and to uh, be asymptomatic. So if they, um, if they have it, they will be showing clinical signs. Um, they're also not shedding the, um, the bacteria in their um, feces. So clinical signs um, are going to include acute or profuse diarrhea. Again, they're gonna be anorexic, dehydrated, lethargic. There'll be lots of fecal staining in the hindquarters due to the diarrhea. And then they can die between 12 to 24 hours once you see these clinical signs. All right, so again, Tizer's disease is going to be something that can rear its ugly head due to stress. All right, and again, those stressors can include overcrowding, shipping, poor ventilation, and even improper nutrition. Okay, so this can be diagnosed um, at necropsy uh, by staining different uh, tissues. So staining the liver, the heart, and even the cecum to identify any of these clostridial species, uh, specifically uh, uh, clostridial uh, uh, piliformi. We can also run a LISA test, um, IFA test, and PCR assays. So how do we treat it? Well, by the time we're seeing clinical signs, it's really going to be difficult to treat because the prognosis is going to be poor. Again, remember, by the time we see this, they're going to be dead within 12 to 24 hours. So we can try. So we can try to give them oxy oxytetracycline, which is an antibiotic. Uh, but the best thing that we can do is just be proactive. Again, we know that those spores are going to um, persist in the environment for a long period of time. It's difficult to get rid of spores. So the best thing that we can do is ensure that we have really good sound husbandry practices, right? So um, cleaning routinely, you know, the animals' cages are being sanitized routinely, um, and also just eliminating any type of stressful factors. So not housing them, you know, around um, um, loud animals, not, you know, overcrowding them, making sure that the ventilation is proper. All of those things can be pre um, prevented, right? And so, again, when we can prevent these types of things uh, from happening, these stressors, then it's um, not likely that they will develop Tizer's disease. All right. So the next bacterial disease we'll talk about is Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, we know that Staph is a normal bacteria that lives on the skin. It lives um, in the conjunctiva. It's in our nasal pathogen, um, um, pathways. It's, it's pretty much everywhere. Um, in rabbits, though, this is going to be the most common re uh, reason for conjunctivitis. Now, um, if these infections become pathogenic, which means they can cause disease, 
what it will look like is septicemia. We can get dermatitis and even abscesses. Okay. The next thing that we can see in our does is mastitis. So the common term for mastitis when we are talking about rabbits, rabbit does, is blue breast. Okay, and there could be a, a number of agents that cause mastitis here. Um, st um, Staphylococcus aureus, Pasteurella, and even Streptococcus um, aureus can cause mastitis. And the reason that this happens is because um, lots of times the um, as the as the um, the kids are nursing, they can cause trauma to the teeth when they bite, right? And so that bite leaves an open wound, right? And then that allows staph, pastorella, and even strep to enter into that wound and cause an issue, in this case, um, mastitis. So, um, um, so that's one thing that could happen. Um, another thing that could happen is splinters from nesting boxes or from nest boxes. Um, if the animal were to get a splinter, Again, this is going to allow or going to be an open wound for these agents to, to grow, all right? And so how do we treat this? Well, the first thing we need to do is remove the, remove the kits as soon as possible if we see this because they can't continue to nurse, right? That has to be really painful for the doe. Move them um, and hopefully there is a doe that, that will nurse them. Um, <clears throat> we can also give some antibiotics, appropriate antibiotics. And then um, if abscesses do occur, we can land and flush those abscesses. All right, so Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, again, this is an uncommon pathogen. We talked about seeing this in our mice and our rats as well. Um, anytime, anytime you see Pseudomonas um, within the rodent um, colonies or even in our lagomorphs, um, more than likely it's going to be due to contaminated water. This is primarily how this organism gets in. And in rabbits, it causes a skin infection and it's going to have a blue greenish discoloration. Lots of times you're gonna see this in the dewlap area, um, in areas that contain lots of moisture. So remember that dewlap I described to you guys, like your airline pillow, you turn it around, you have this big, huge fluff of skin here. That's what it looks like on our, on our does. But if you lift up, again, oh, there's a lot of moisture that can build up under that area. Um, and so that's a place where, again, drinking the um the um the pathogen could be in in the water and it could cause you know moisture underneath and then it could proliferate and cause an issue. So um, the first thing we need to do is make sure that we um, e um, evaluate the drinking water because more than likely that's how the pathogen got in into the system. Okay, if we were to see this, we would of course need to remove any of the fur that is in the area that has been affected and clean those lesions. We can apply um, any type of um, a topical um, antibiotic, or we can even give systemic antibiotics, again, the appropriate ones, all right? And um, again, make sure that we look at that drinking water because that is likely the source of contamination. Now, if this is not caught early on, this infection can extend to other organs, right? So. This is something that is normally just going to be something that's on the skin, you know, superficial, but if we don't treat it, it can cause other issues. All right, so the next bacterial disease we're gonna talk about is spirochetosis, also known as rabbit syphilis. Yes, rabbits can get syphilis. It's also known as vent disease or treponematosis. All right, this is caused by uh, the bacteria treponema, Paralus conicoli, all right? So this is specific, this specific syphilis is specific to rabbits, okay? Um, <clears throat> it looks and sounds exactly the same as human syphilis would, okay? We, it, it looks um, like raised crusty lesions. Um, it's ulcerative and typically it's going to be found around the genitalia, the perianal region, and even the face. Now, this is contact. This is direct contact. This is a, 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 a venereal disease, 
again, caused by direct contact. Okay, anytime we have animals that are actually showing clinical signs of syphilis, they have to be removed. They need to be isolated during that acute period, okay? Um, the best treatment is penicillin. So uh, penicillin is known to be the most effective, but we have to, again, use caution because we do not want to cause enterotoxemia. And again, this is a picture showing those lesions around the uh, perianal region of the animal. Again, um, crusty ulcerative lesions. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and jump into uh, viral diseases that we can see in our rabbits. Uh, the first one we're gonna talk about is myxomatosis. This is caused by a pox virus, um, known as the myxoma virus. All right, there are many, many different strains that can exist. And these different strains are also going to show different levels of disease or pathogenicity. Now, we see this quite a bit in, um, in different locations. So it's endemic, which means that we're talking about particular locations um, in Australia, Europe, South America, and North America. And the natural host for this pox virus is the U.S. wild cottontail. So all the little bunnies we were talking about the other day that we see um, out hopping around in the wild, those are those. So it's very likely that they are carrying this virus, okay? It is in zoonotic and wild um, erectologous species in western U.S. So uh, the transmission here is typically going to be through a mosquito or a flea some type of anthropod vector, um, but it can also be, uh, uh, be given through or transmitted through direct contact. Okay, so clinical signs of the myxomatosis. Uh, what we're first going to see is some small growths um, in the subcutaneous tissue. They're gonna be gelatinous growths, okay? And then um, as the virus progresses on, what we end up seeing is a mucopurulent conjunctivitis. And then we're going to start to see generalized edema. So now the skin is going to begin to look more, more swollen, okay, all the way around. And then eventually the animal's eyes are going to be swollen shut and their ears are going to again begin to droop. So we diagnose this um, by isolating the virus. Um, we could also do some type of PCR um, of the infected tissue. Now, there is a vaccine for this. Unfortunately, um, it has not been approved here in the U.S., but it is um, used in Europe. So I know it's a little bit hard to appreciate um, in this picture, but this is a rabbit that has a myxomatosis. Um, he, his eyes are, again, shut. They're swollen shut. He looks pretty lethargic. Um, his ears are back. Um, notice that his fur is unkempt, so he is not feeling well at all. Okay, so the next viral disease we're going to talk about is, ha is rabbit hemorrhagic disease, or RHD. This is caused by the Khaleesi, uh, the Khaleesi virus, and it is very, very um, highly contagious. Um, I don't know if you guys watch the news often. I hope you do. You learn a lot on the news. <laughs> But um, maybe this was probably earlier on within the pandemic, so sometime maybe mid-pandemic last year, um, there was an RHD outbreak right here in Houston. Um, many dead rabbits were just popping up around the city, and uh, you know, so they were you know being pulled in. Path um, pathologists were working on them, and it was due to the uh, rabbit hemorrhagic disease uh, virus. Okay, again, it's highly contagious. Um, it is spread through direct contact or even um, aerosolization. And this has been seen pretty much all around the world, uh, Asia, Europe, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, and right here in the US. Now, typically this is going to be something that is seen in older rabbits, old, uh, rabbits that are um, older than two months of old, um, two months of age. Our younger rabbits um, typically are not going to show any clinical signs of an infection, which finally they get a little bit of a break. So the transmission here uh, for RHD um, is direct contact or, fe um, or fecal oral contact, um, fomites, and even vectors. 
Okay, so this can be, again, transmitted through fomites and vectors. Now, there is a very quick onset of disease here, and it's because this virus is going to attack the nervous system, right? So what we end up seeing with these animals is, um, is a lot of shaking and incoordination and even um, postration. So the term postration is extreme physical weakness. So this is extreme lethargy, like the animal will, will be, you may find the animal just laid out flat on the ground um, because their whole nervous system is being affected here, right? You need your nervous system in order to, you know, move around and do, do normal things. And this virus is um, attacking the nervous system. So anytime we hear the term hemorrhagic disease, we know it's not going to be good. Um, just like here, um, the morbidity and the mortality is between 80 and 100%. So if an animal gets RHD, they are going to die pretty much. All right. Um, so when they are necropsied, what we end up seeing is gross lesions, um, hemorrhagic um, trachea, lungs, liver, spleen, everything. Everything is going to be hemorrhagic. And the most common um, reason for death is DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. Okay, so here's a picture of a rabbit of a rabbit with um, RHD. Um, again, notice that the head is down. Um, this rabbit is not sleeping. This rabbit is very, very ill. The rabbit can't move. It's, un, you know, he's uncoordinated. It's extreme lethargy. This is that uh, prostration that we were just talking about um, on the last, on the last uh, couple of slides. Um, again, this was um, on the news, again, not that long ago. So this is something that is still out there and is killing, killing rabbits. Okay, so um, how do we diagnose RHD? Well, um, it's going to be obviously found um, after death, so during a necropsy. Um, what we can do is we can do an ELISA test and we can do PCR testing of any of the infected tissue. Now, if this is something that we find within the colony, the whole colony just needs to be cold because um, you can imagine this is not a very nice death, DIC. I would, yeah. Not a very nice way to go. All right. Um, now, there is a vaccine that is available here. Um, currently, though, it's only um, for the areas and where the disease is um, endemic. So, again, that means that it's concentrated in those areas. Um, I did do some research on this. Um, there has been some recent outbreaks in some of the southwestern states. Um, some vets, you know, if, you, if it's something that you want, you probably have to pay a little bit of little bit of dinero for it, but um, some vets can get vaccines from other veterinarians um, who live in those in those regions, if that's a, a treatment or that's a vaccination that you want for your animal. All right, so moving on to parasitic diseases, rabbits can get ear mites. The ear mites are going to be caused by Seropthes cunicoli. So remember that cunicoli, that's actually a part of their scientific name, right? Erectologus um, um, cunicoli. Now, this particular ear mite is a non-burrowing mite, but what it does is it chews on the epidermis um, uh, layer of the skin um, and within the pinna. And so after all of that chewing, um, it causes lots of, um, lots of puritis. Um, there's brown, crusty materials that are all within the inner pinna of the ear. Um, it gets inflamed. Right, the animal is constantly scratching at it. it. It just never really has an opportunity to heal. Um, and so, what's interesting here is that all the life stages of the mite are going to be found on the rabbit, instead of you know how we see it with sometimes um, our dogs and cats, where we only see the adults, um, or we may see the egg. We see all of the life stages here. Now, in research, this is very rare. We yeah, we don't see this in our research colonies. We already know that. But it is um, common in rabbits who are raised um, in agriculture or even rabbits that are within the pet industry. Um, so we need to take care of this immediately because, again, if this is causing intense uh, puritis for the, for the rabbit, then they are going to begin to self-mutilate, right? It's something that 
obviously not purposely, but it's it's itchy. It's very itchy. So they're going to scratch and scratch and scratch and scratch and scratch. They might scratch their whole ear off. It, it itches so bad. So this is something that we need to um, take care of uh, quickly when it's seen. All right, and here's our little rabbit ear mite. Um, again, we can uh, visually uh, diagnose this the same way we do mites on our dogs and cats, just by taking um, some of that crusty material that we see, you know, getting down in that ear, um, putting it on some oil and looking under, looking at it under the microscope. So here is the microscopic picture of our ear mite. Uh, treatments exactly the same as for any other parasi um, parasite that we would treat in dogs and cats, ivermectin, uh, moxidectin, or uh, selamectin. Um, and then animals, of course, who uh, are extremely pyritic, we might need to give them other things, um, analgesics, especially just to help with that pain. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here because um, um, I have videos for us to watch the next time. Uh, so basically what I'm going to do, this will be posted for you. Well, I guess you don't need to know that, right? I'm going to send you an email. But what I would like for you to do is go ahead. I'll have like five questions for you guys to answer um, just so I know that you reviewed um, this portion of the lecture. So you guys have a, fant a fantabulous weekend. I will see you all on Tuesday. Bye.